say, can you see? stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs Let's sing America the Beautiful and My Country Tis of These. Please stand. of reading. O oh God, you are my God. I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you, sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. 
Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. As as long as I live, I will lift up my hands and call on your name. Therefore, the redeemed of the Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that we live in a nation, Lord, that we celebrate. Lord, we thank you for the freedom we have to come into this house to worship you and give you praise and glory for all things you do in our lives. Father, as we listen to the music, the spoken word from Pastor Smith, Lord, open our ears to hear what the Spirit has to say to us as you pour out your blessings upon us and speak to us in your still, small voice. We give you praise and glory, Lord, for all that is here today, Lord, and those that are traveling, be with them. We give you praise again, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Welcome and announcements. I've been told by somebody to announce that next week, those that have Corvettes or Firebirds or old cars or a Camaro, beautiful your favorite car you're to bring it to church next week we're going to have a mini car show in the parking lot so i guess my 2016 ford escape don't count so i'm going to bring it anyway but so if you've got those cars bring them got yours john there you go got your vet scott pastor smith If my wife lets me, maybe I'll go buy one, bring it next week. (laughs) I doubt that. I'll be in the 2016 escape. The other announcements. First of all, I want to welcome the Heritage Baptist Church from Grand Rapids, Michigan. The bicyclers. (laughs) They rode their bikes from Bikankakee yesterday to be with us today and stay all night last night and have a good fellowship, beautiful testimonies from people they met along the way that they shared the Lord with. It was just a beautiful night, topped off by the fireworks. So we're glad you're here. Thank you for coming, for choosing us, to bless us. The other announcements for this week, Monday the church office will close, is closed, of course, for the 4th of July. Tuesday, the Baptist Presbyterians play St. Mary's Red. As you recall last week, when I gave the announcements, I asked you to kind of pray, not that the Lord really cares if we win or not, but I think he does. We played a really tough team, and we won on Tuesday night, and then we prayed again, and guess what? We beat them 23-3 on Thursday night. So this week we're playing St. Mary's Red, another tough team, and Fairbury Baptist. We have to beat the Baptist. Pontiac has to beat Fairbury. So if you can say a little prayer that the Lord listens to, it would be appreciated. Don, I expect good news next week. (laughs) I (laughs) know. 
I'll leave that alone, Don. Wednesday at 9 o'clock, we had the Ruth Circle here at the church. 9 o'clock is also the retired old men eating out, which I'm a part of. I'm retired, but I'm not old. Not like some that are in this room. Hi, Ken. So come and join us if you get the chance at Baby Bulls. Then, of course, we have our 10.30 prayer time and our 7 o'clock where we come to gather and pray for this nation and for all that's going on in this world and for this church for the future. Then Thursday at 9 o'clock, I believe, is or 10, is it, Karen? It's 9 to 10, right? Yeah, for the jam story time for the kids. And like I said, Baptist Presbyterians versus Fairbury Baptist. As you see in the bulletin, Vacation Bible School is coming up. The Knights of the North Castle. Children ages 5 through 5th grade are welcome to attend. If you get the newsletter out there on the Learning Center, it has a list of the supplies that are needed for Vacation Bible School. So uh, registration forms are out there also, and all the information that you need for that. So please get that. Julie, you want to come forward for the children's story? tomorrow, 4th of July, which is also called Independence Day. So what do we do on Independence Day? Fireworks? Uh, people have picnics? Why, why are we celebrating on the 4th of July? Our independence? <laughs> she said it's country's birthday. <laughs> so yeah, we're, we're celebrating our independence from England, <laughs> and um, we have certain rights and privileges that other countries don't have. Did you know that other countries uh, don't let you go to church? Did you know that? Yeah. You can't have a Bible. You can't pray out loud in public. Um, so we're very fortunate that we live in a place that we can do that and we can tell other people about Jesus and without fear of getting arrested or getting in trouble, right? Um, but there's also another kind of freedom, and this comes from Jesus. What kind of freedom is that? Hmm? Sin. Freedom from sin. Very good. So once we accept Jesus, um, we can if we do something wrong, if we tell a lie, like your, your um, mom says you can't have a piece of candy until after dinner, and you sneak it anyway, and you, mom says, what happened to that candy? I don't know. Well, you got chocolate all around your face, so you probably ate it, right? But you told, us, told a lie, and that's a sin. But we get to go to Jesus and, well, first apologize to mom. We get to go to Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm sorry that I... Uh, lied to my mom and please forgive me and he forgives you so um, sometimes we get caught up in the sin and we do it over and over and over but the thing is if you ask Jesus to forgive your sin he doesn't want you to do it again he doesn't want you to go turn around and do it again he wants you to do the right thing and so when we say I'm sorry Jesus I did, shouldn't have done that please forgive me He'll forgive you, but you're not supposed to do it again. So, so we're lucky we live in a place where we get to go to church. Are you glad to be here? Uh-huh. You know, we have the opportunity to go to um, jam, Jesus and me story time. Some other kids don't get to do that in other countries. So if you're free on Thursday mornings at 9 o'clock, you can go out to the pavilion and listen to the story time with uh, Karen Meister. We have Vacation Bible School coming up, so invite your friends, and let's take advantage of this, uh, this, 
this opportunity um, to worship God the way that we want to worship God. And we don't have to worry about being tangled up in um, the sin that we live. And I pray that uh, we each remember that. Uh, especially remember tomorrow, be thankful. What should we be thankful for tomorrow? Hmm? Our freedom, yes, very good. Um, be thankful for your freedom. Be thankful that we live in a country where we get to do these kinds of things and not get in trouble. Let's say a prayer, and then I have some Smarties for you. So for each Smartie you eat, I want you to think of one thing that you are thankful for, for each one. Can you do that? So you'll have to be thankful for a lot, and we should be thankful for a lot. Okay, let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for allowing us to be here today. I thank you that we live in a place where we can come and worship you, and we can love you openly. And I pray that we um, are able to share what we believe with other kids. And pray that we are brave enough to invite other kids to church, to Sunday school, and to some of the extra activities we have, uh, especially Vacation Bible School coming up. And I pray that we each remember, each and every day, how thankful we are for you and for your forgiveness of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing, We Give Thee But Thine Own. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to give back our tithes and our offerings to you. Father, we ask that you bless those that can give, and for those that can't afford to give, Lord, but still do, we ask you to give them a double portion blessing. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to share the gospel through our offerings with American Baptist churches around this country and around the world, and through our missions. We give you praise for all things that we have. Lord, you blessed us so much. We give you thanks, Lord. Amen.
every week we ask the same question, how's your prayer life? How is the talk between you and the Lord? Do you feel that sometimes he isn't listening? I got news for you, he is. He always says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So he's always walking with us, no matter if we feel him or not. He's there, and he wants us to call on him. News of the family. I still want you to remember Phyllis Bowman at Accolade, and also Mary Ann Heiss at home. Remember her in your prayers. Mike Toon was hospitalized again this week, and he has since returned home. But I know it's been a long road for them for the last year or so. And I know Carol and Mike need your prayers badly. That they've turned the corner and things are going to start getting better. That God's going to touch his hand down on them and bring them sunshine again through this hard road. And I thank you for your prayers for them. And I also want you to pray for our bike riders. They'll be staying here again today but they'll be heading out tomorrow, headed for Six Flags. And I want you to pray for them for safe travel, out if they're on the roadways, and that they're able to return home to Michigan safely. And again, I thank them for being here, for sharing with us. Let's pray. Father, we do come before your throne. Lord, asking you for healing for our brothers and sisters. Lord, we ask you to put your hand down on Mike and Carol. Lord, it's been a tough, tough road for them to hoe. But Lord, you're with them. You're always there in their time of need. And Lord, we ask you to wrap your arms around them for healing, for comfort, for peace. Lord, let them know they're getting near the top of that hill where the sun's shining Lord, we ask you to still be with Phyllis, Lord, and also with Mary Ann. Lord, we ask you to put your arms around them, give them peace and comfort. And Lord, I also ask for prayer for the bicycle group and their ones that are traveling with them. Lord, please give them traveling mercies. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to have them and host them and to be so blessed by their testimony as they travel and stop and tell people about the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, it's an awesome, awesome blessing. Lord, and I thank you for them. Give them safe travels home, Lord. And Lord, we give you praise and glory for all things. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Pastor Smith is filling the pulpit today. I'm glad to have him and his wife Val and their daughter here also visiting with them. Pastor Smith. I thought about riding my bicycle to church today, but it took me two hours to drive here, and I thought, you know, that's probably not a good idea because, number one, I'm out of shape, and number two, how long would it take me to get here if I did? That's about right. So I thought I'd leave the bike riding to somebody else this morning. How many of you saw on the news just within the last day or two about the bodies of the three children and a woman, a mother, found in a lake in Minnesota? Did did any of you hear that on the news? Okay, some of you heard about that. And then the body of the father of the children also found in a different location. Now you can, I'm not a betting man, but if I were a betting man, you could almost assume that's another one in that long list of murder-suicides. Doesn't it look that way to you? When we think about our country on this celebratory weekend, it's great to have all the pork chops and the hamburgers and hot dogs and watermelon and all the rest of it. But we need to be serious 
about the condition of our country. How many of you heard in the news this past week about the three police officers who were shot and killed in Kentucky along with the canine helper responding to the domestic violence call? How many of you heard about that one? I think there's a line in Shakespeare somewhere, it might be from Hamlet, it said there's something rotten in Denmark. Well, there's something rotten, but it's not in Denmark, it's in the United States of America. Let's take, for example, the city of Philadelphia. You know what the name Philadelphia means? It's supposed to be the city of brotherly love. Beginning in 2014, homicides in Philadelphia began to rise. Eight years ago, there were 249. By 2017, there were 317. And then there was just an explosion. The murder rate in Philadelphia was 499 in 2020, which is a 40% increase from the year before. And the interesting thing about these homicides was that the police department had been seeking to solve these crimes and they had only solved about 42% of the murder cases in 2020, less than half. The police commissioner has been at the helm for two and a half years and she called this solution rate alarming. And she asks these questions, what's going on here? Why is this happening? Those are great questions. But let's bring it a little closer to home for a moment. Just a couple hours north, right in our backyard, Chicago. There have already been 300 people killed this year. Last year, Chicago had 800 homicides, a level not seen in 25 years. And those numbers don't even include Whatever killings may have occurred in self-defense or other circumstances not measured in the Chicago police station, including homicides that involve Illinois State Police, those are not included in that number. The interesting thing about homicides in Chicago is most of them are gunshot wounds and most of them are young, black, male. Well, What's wrong with this picture? In Proverbs 28, verse 2, it says, When there is moral rot within a nation, its government topples easily. But with honest, sensible leaders, there is stability. If we want to pray for something, we ought to be praying for honest, sensible leaders. They seem to be in short supply. Honest, sensible leaders. I invite you to turn in your pew Bibles to page 431, or if you're using a device, take a look at 2 Chronicles chapter 7. And I think it's important for us to set the context of what is going on in this particular chapter. It happens to be the dedication of the temple that Solomon had built. <clears throat> now you have to remember that Solomon had spent maybe 13 years or so, building this magnificent temple for the Lord. And he used many of the vast materials of gold and silver and precious stones and all the rest of it that his father David had collected. And after he had built this temple, the first half of the chapter, Second Chronicles chapter 7, it tells us about this wonderful dedication that they had. You talk about a celebration, that was a celebration. I'm not going to get into all the details of that because I want to focus on the second half of the chapter where it says that that night the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream and said to him, I've heard your prayer, the prayer of dedication where I've chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice and then God said something very, very sobering to Solomon. Listen to what he said next. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people. Does that sound familiar? 
Verse 14, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. My message this morning is entitled, Seven Verbs. And if I counted right, there should be seven verbs in that last verse, verse 14. Three of them apply to God, but four of them apply to us. Now just imagine for a moment that you had been Solomon and you've just finished building this beautiful temple, you've spent 13 years doing it, and God comes to you in this dream in the middle of the night And he gives him this serious warning, which you can read beginning in verse 19. But if you and your people Israel turn aside and forsake my statutes and my commandments that I have set before you, and you go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will pluck you up from this land that I have given you, and this house which I have consecrated for my name, I will cast out of my sight and will make it a proverb and a byword among all the peoples. And regarding this house now exalted, everyone passing by will be astonished and say, why has the Lord done such a thing in this land and to this house? What's the Lord doing? He's saying to Solomon, there's going to come a time here in the future where because of the unfaithfulness of the people, this place will be totally destroyed. I don't know about you, but if I'd been Solomon and I just spent 13 years building this thing and God comes to me in a dream the night of the consecration and the dedication and says baby it's going to be all leveled I think that would probably send me in the direction of depression but that's what the Lord did and he said why verse 22 they'll say because they abandoned the Lord their God and they adopted other gods This verse, verse 14, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, is probably the best prescription in all of Scripture, Old Testament or New Testament, in all of Scripture. This is the best description you can probably find anywhere in the Bible to describe the way revival comes about. Seven verbs. Seven verbs. Now it begins with those first four that says, if my people who are called by my name, and note what it does not say. It does not say if these heathen, unregenerate, wicked people will repent. No, 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 no. What's it say? Read it carefully. It says, if my people, the people who call themselves Christians, the people who are supposed to be my people if they will humble themselves pray seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then I will heal their land now notice it says humble themselves now I'm gonna have a little fun with Harlan this morning you know all of us need a little humility at times And sometimes the way the Lord keeps us humble is he gives us a loss on the field. Competitive sports are one of the ways that the Lord likes to spank our rear ends, okay, if I could put it diplomatically. But you know, all of us, all of us need a little bit of humility from time to time. And notice it says, You don't wait for someone else to humble you. You can humble yourselves. You can be the good sport. You can be the one who admits, I've been wrong or I've sinned. Humble themselves, pray. If I were to ask you how many hours this past week you spent in prayer, how many would there be? I like your question. How's your prayer life today? Seek my face. You know, the scripture says we're not going to find the Lord unless we seek him, and seek him with what? Our whole heart. Not half-heartedly, not some of the time, all of the time, continually. Pray without ceasing, the scripture says. Seek my face, and then lastly, turn from their wicked ways. And see, the problem is today, as believers and as Christians, 
often we don't really see ourselves as wicked. We don't really think we have wicked ways from which we should repent. We don't bow down and worship idols made of wood and covered with gold and silver like ancient civilizations, like Israel of old did. And so we sort of think like, you know, wicked ways, what wicked ways? Well, you know what? We do have other gods in America. We have other gods in America. You don't think so? Play a little game. Give me your wallet. Give me your wallet. It's in the car. What an excuse. All right. I want to see your purse. I want your checkbook. I want your credit card. Oh, wise woman. (laughs) You know, every time you pick up the phone and it's one of those robocalls, what are they trying to do? They're trying to get in your wallet. They're trying to get in your purse. Every time you turn on TV and you hear a commercial, you hear an advertisement, what are they communicating to you? They are communicating to you that there's something they have that you need, and it's only going to cost you $19.99 a month for the next seven years. Now, what I suggest to you this morning is we do have other gods. One of the gods that we have is called the almighty dollar. Now there's nothing wrong with capitalism or free enterprise or any of those things, but when we become obsessed with it, when it becomes the reason we live and breathe, when we, when we literally drive ourselves into the grave as workaholics because we want to get more and more and more, somebody said one time, how much does it take to make a rich man happy? Just a little bit more? Yeah, we have other gods. The almighty dollar being one of them. Fast forward to the book of Ezekiel. And in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 16, there's an interesting complaint that God registers against his people, the faithless Israel. And I warn you, I warn you, This is an X-rated sermon this morning because I'm going to reference some of those passages of Scripture that you did not study in junior high Sunday school. But it's there. Ezekiel chapter 16 is entitled God's Faithless Bride. And he talks about how Jerusalem in particular was young and grew up roughly In verse 8, it says, I looked on you, you were at the age for love. And so God basically took her under his wing. He betrothed her to himself. And she became beautiful, verse 13. You grew exceedingly beautiful, fit to be a queen. Your fame spread among the nations on account of your beauty. For it was perfect because of my splendor that I had bestowed on you, says the Lord God. Verse 15, but you trusted in your beauty and played the whore. God calls his own people whores. And he goes on in the chapter to say, verse 30, how sick is your heart that you did all these things. And he's talking about how they worshipped other gods. They were unfaithful to him. And he said, The interesting thing about a prostitute is that she's paid for what she does, but you went out and you paid your lovers to be with you. You're worse than a prostitute. I mean, folks, these are strong words. I didn't write this. Don't get mad at me. I'm just telling you what the good book says. And basically, he goes down through this list and he takes them to task. By the time he gets to verse 46... He uses as an object lesson the city of Sodom. Now, as soon as I say the name of the city, most of you associate particular sins with that city. But in verse 47, it says, You not only followed their ways and acted according to their abominations, 
within a very little time you were more corrupt than they in all your ways. And verse 49 points out something that most people don't know. If you ask them why was Sodom overthrown, they'll give you one answer. But if you look at this passage of Scripture, it says this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food, prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and needy. Think about that for a moment. The reason Sodom was overthrown was not just one reason. It was several reasons. Pride, excess of food, and ease. Kind of sounds like a lot of places in America today, doesn't it? And you didn't care for the poor and the needy? came across some interesting information that even before the pandemic hit, there were some 13.7 million households, or 10% of all U.S. households, that were experiencing food insecurity at some point in 2019. But the pandemic only worsened the problem. According to one estimate by researchers at Northwestern University, food insecurity more than doubled as a result of the economic crisis brought on by COVID-19, hitting as many as 23% of households in 2020. An analysis by the Brookings Institution conducted in late June, two years ago, showed that 27.5% of households with children were food insecure, meaning that 13.9 million children, in America we're talking about, in America, lived in a household characterized by child food insecurity. A separate analysis by researchers at Northwestern found that food insecurity had tripled among households with children. And black families are twice as likely as white families to face food insecurity. Now we are not talking about third world countries, folks. We're talking about this country. What's wrong with the soul of America? Do we fiddle while Rome burns? Do we enjoy our wonderful fellowship and our celebrations with family and friends tomorrow without giving a thought to the fact that we are skating on thin ice? Really thin ice. That's why there's a message for us today even through this dream that God delivered to Solomon of old. When he says to Solomon, if my people, not your next door neighbor, not the people who live on the other side of the tracks, not those people in Chicago or Philadelphia or wherever, if my people who are called by my name will what? What does it say? Read it to me your Bible say? What's the first verb? Humble ourselves. Isn't there a song, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord? Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. If we will humble ourselves, pray, seek his face, and turn from our wicked ways, then, notice the next three verbs. Verse 4 are for us. The next three are for God. If we will do these four things, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Do we want God to hear us? Do we really want Him to hear us? Does his name really matter? Does it really matter that we're called by his name? I don't know, but the older I get, increasingly the more it bothers me when I'm seeing folks on TV or hearing people even in normal conversation where something surprising happens, and what are the first three words out of their mouths? We even make an abbreviation out of it, OMG. The first words out of their mouths are, oh, my God. And I hear that and I say, do you really want him to hear you? 
Do you really want him to show up right then? Do you really want him to know all that you're thinking and saying and doing? Are you inviting his presence right then? That makes me more careful myself when something surprising happens or I see a beautiful Corvette and I'm tempted to say, OMG, no, 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 be careful. Do not take his name in vain. We have all kinds of gods we worship in this country. We worship the almighty dollar. We worship beauty and intelligence. We worship sometimes social status. Career success. Oh, so-and-so's done well for himself. We have all kinds of gods we worship. God says, no. No. Humble yourselves. Pray. Seek my face. Turn from your wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven. Then I will show up. Then I will forgive their sin. And I will heal their land. Many years ago, there was a man named Neil Wiseman who wrote a book entitled Growing Your Soul. And he says this, Amassing money and possessions has disappointed many people who desperately long for something which new cars, bigger houses, larger paychecks, and fair-weather friends can't provide. Millions are bone-weary of religious activity without purpose. Brilliance without faith. Money without value. Sophistication without substance. And possessions without satisfaction. However, for those who seek an authentic way of life, religion that offers nothing more than nostalgic warm fuzzies to soften the harsh edges of pressing pain will not do. People want genuine spiritual reality. They want to know God in substantial, fulfilling ways, and they are hungry for the holy. I love that phrase. They're hungry for the holy. When you're ready to chow down tomorrow, remind yourself that there's another hunger that's even more important than the hunger you feel tomorrow. There should be a hunger for the holy. One of the greatest prayers of confession in all of Scripture is found in Daniel chapter 9. After what God warned Solomon of, the night that the temple was dedicated happened many years later. Daniel was carried off into Babylon as one of the ca captivities, and he served not only the Babylonian Empire, but then the Medes and the Persians. And one day, God said to Daniel, I want you to intercede for the nation of Israel. And Daniel got down on his knees. Verse 3 of Daniel chapter 9. I turned to the Lord to seek an answer by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession because you see the captivity was almost over. The 70 years was almost done. And Daniel's praying saying, God, What's next? But he, get, he began by saying, Oh Lord, great and awesome God, we have sinned and done wrong. We have acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and ordinances. We have not listened to your servants. Righteousness is on your side, O oh Lord, but open shame this day falls on us, the people of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. And so the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us. All this calamity has come upon us, and we did not entreat the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and reflecting on his fidelity. We have disobeyed his voice. We have sinned. We have done wickedly. O oh Lord, in view of all your righteous acts, let your anger and wrath, we pray, turn away from your city, Jerusalem. You want to pray something for America today? Pray that God's anger and wrath will be turned aside because it's already beginning. Now, therefore, O oh God, listen to the prayer of your servant. Let your face shine upon your desolated sanctuary. Open your eyes and look at our desolation, this city that bears your name. 
We do not present our supplication before you on the ground of our righteousness, but on the ground of your great mercy. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen. There are some more verbs for you. Listen and act and do not delay. For your own sake, O oh my God, because your city and your people bear your name. You know, America is supposed to be a Christian nation. Right? Supposed to be. Daniel was on his knees interceding for his people in the nation of Israel, and he said, Oh God, for your own sake, for the sake of your name, hear our prayer. We're not going to talk about prayer this morning. We're going to do it. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today. We do rejoice in the freedom that you have given to us. But we also know that because of one man's pride, our world teeters on the edge of World War III. We know, Lord, that even though the Civil War was fought in this country a century and a half ago, we are so divided today that we could easily, easily descend into another Civil War over a dozen different issues. And so we come to you today, Lord, and we say to you, we humble ourselves. We cast ourselves upon your mercy. We seek your face, for there is deliverance from no one else. You are the one who makes great. You are the one who defines greatness. You are the one who gives greatness. For the scripture tells us that you are the one who exalts, and you are the one who casts down. We come to you, Lord, humbly, prayerfully seeking your face in order that you may hear that you may forgive that you may heal in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ we pray Amen Let's stand and sing Battle Hymn of the Republic verses 1 and 4 I'm going to say the blessing, and then we're going to close with bind us together. And here's where I get to ask something else. Bind us together has always been a traditional song in our church at the end. 
And several years ago, we started the tradition of holding hands with the people beside you. And with the COVID, we stopped doing that. Well, you know what? I want us to do that today. We're going to hold hands with our brothers and sisters. We're going to sing this song, and we're going to build that chain that the devil can't destroy. And I'm saying he can't destroy it. Nobody can split this chain because we're bound together in the love of Christ, and he reigns in our lives, and we are going to build that chain. So now the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance, give you peace, now and forevermore. Amen. And God bless you real good.